Let's open in prayer before we open our Bibles. Fathers, we come before you at this time, Lord. We are preparing to open the Word of God and to preach. Lord, the message you've laid on my heart is, Lord, I believe it's needful for many of us, all of us for sure, certain. But Lord, there's folks that are hurting, folks that are struggling, for one reason or another. And so as you've led me to this passage, I pray your Holy Spirit would lead and guide in each heart. Lord, that you would bring conviction where it's needed, counsel where it's needed, comfort. And Lord, we'll rely on you in all that's said and done. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You open your Bibles to the book of Lamentations this morning. Lamentations, chapter number 3. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. Prophet Jeremiah, of course, wrote the book of Lamentations. And the context of the passage here is that he is bemoaning the state of Jerusalem specifically because it has fallen to Babylon. Jeremiah was a prophet who was going around telling people, hey, the Babylonians are coming and you're going to go into captivity to Babylon. Jerusalem and in fact all of Judea, the southern kingdom of Judah, is all going to fall to Babylon. And he told them, just understand this is going to happen. This is the judgment of God. And when you're taken to Babylon, uh, go ahead and buy houses and start businesses and, and uh, put down roots for a little while because you're going to be there for 70 years. And then the Lord's going to bring you back out. But the Bible says nobody listened to him. They wouldn't listen to him. And so that has now happened, and he's now writing the book of Lamentations. And he is lamenting the state of Jerusalem, how it has fallen into disarray and all that has happened there. Now, Jeremiah was a faithful prophet, and God was not judging Jeremiah, but he felt so close to Jerusalem and all that was going on there that in chapter 3, he is putting himself in the place of Jerusalem and as if these things have come upon him. Uh, and so that's kind of the context of what he is saying there. The language, though, that Jeremiah uses is something that you might hear from someone who feels that God has abandoned them or feels that they are under God's judgment or is going through a trial and wondering how long this will last. In Sunday school, we're going through the book of Job and well, we talked about Job and his questions and wondering how long is this going to last. We've all been there. And if we, like Jeremiah, put our ourselves in that place, we might use some of the same language. Maybe you've never said these things out loud. Maybe you would never say these things to God. But if you were going to express the true feeling of your heart, you might use some of this language. Let's read a little bit of it. Lamentations. Let me get the right book. I told y'all and I went to the wrong book. There we go. Lamentations chapter 3, verse number 1. I am the man that hath seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He hath led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Surely against me is he turned. He turneth his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin hath he made old. He hath broken my bones. He hath builded against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He hath set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. And when I cry and shout, he shutteth out my prayer. He hath enclosed my ways with hewn stones. He hath made my paths crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He hath made me desolate. He hath bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. He hath caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. I was a derision to all my people and their song all the day. 
We may use similar language as we think about the state of the world we live in. Think about wars going on around the world. Hey, listen, if you, if you are, have a tender heart and you love the Lord and you love people because God loves people, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, right? We see folks in the midst of war and it breaks our heart. And we think of crime. We think of the poverty that is around the world. We, we have no idea how blessed we are in America. Think of natural disasters all around the world. And then we think of our own country, the state we're in here, financially, more important, morally. And it breaks our heart when we think that regardless of how inflated the numbers may be, it is still the case that many in our own beloved country are willing to throw away all the gains that we have made by freedom and by biblical principles for the false hope of a government to take care of everything. It breaks our heart to think of that. Think of churches, some that used to stand strong on the fundamentals of the Word of God and have thrown it all away, compromised, left the old paths for the latest popular trend. More personally and impactfully though, we think of issues in our own family. Maybe there's someone in your family that's not saved. It breaks your heart. Or someone who is saved but they're far from the Lord. And you've prayed for them. Maybe someone in your family is dealing with the consequences of sin or just dealing with the trials of life and just not doing well with it. Maybe there's financial or physical or family problems or trauma. Maybe a relationship is not what it should be or what it could be. Maybe a child is distant or a spouse is cold or cut off. Maybe the trial is within our own self. Maybe the old devil, the old enemy has come back and dragged back up those things from before you were saved. You remember what you did? Who do you think you are? Think you could be a child of God. Maybe the sin that we've committed since we're saved, we, though we've confessed it and, and it's, it's paid for, but we look at it and it just drags us down again and again. Maybe we've been told, boy, you, you can't do anything for the Lord. Who do you think you are? Things in our life drag us down. Maybe we believe the lie that we're not able to be used of God because of failures or weakness. Maybe things that we have been through still have their hooks in us and we just can't seem to get past them. Continue reading with me, if you will, beginning in verse 15 of Lamentations 3. He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. Maybe you think your trial is not as bad as someone else's. Maybe you think it's worse than others. Maybe no one understands. You've tried to explain it, but you just can't get across, regardless of how big or small or misunderstood your trial is. Here's the fact you need to know. The battleground is the mind. The battleground is the mind. It is in the mind that the castles... <laughs> Seeming castles of doubt and defeat and disbelief rise up on the horizon like mountains and they seem insurmountable. You look at things and you say, that's too big, I can't get over that. That's too big, I can't get through that, I can't get around that. All in the mind. Jesus said, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and then they might have it more abundantly. You see, it's the enemy that is the thief. He steals and he kills 
and he destroys. The world is a thief. The world tells us, hey, you're no different than we are. Who do you think you are that you could serve God, do something for him? Our old flesh becomes the enemy. You know what you've done. Everybody else thinks you're really something spiritual, but we know what you really are. The old devil is the enemy. He tries to steal our joy. and he, he can't, If you're saved, he can't get your soul. Amen. But boy, he can get your testimony. He can get your joy. He can get your peace. That's what the enemy does. But Jesus does not steal and kill and destroy. He brings life and life more abundant. And so if we are struggling with these issues here, we know it's not something the Lord has brought. It is the enemy. So why do we suffer so? The mind is a fertile field and the seeds that we plant will produce after their kind. If we plant seeds of truth and faith, they'll bring forth fruitful trees of nourishment and health. But if we plant the noxious weeds of doubt and disbelief, then they will bring forth that which chokes out our faith and our joy and our hope for the future. But here's the thing, you're the gardener. You decide what gets planted in that field. Well, what did the prophet do? Uh, did he give up all hope that he would ever be rescued? That he would ever reemerge into the light? Or did he have an answer? Did he know the secret to battling the enemy of the mind? Let's look and see what he did. Verse 21. This I recall to my mind. Therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. He had learned the secret. His mind was filled with all of these things. He looked around it at his blessed and precious Jerusalem and it was falling down. And he said, Lord, it's like you, you've come after me time and again. I don't know if I'll ever get out of this. But then he said, but then I remember the Lord. Oh, he is merciful. And his mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And I remember that the one who trusts in him, God will take care of him. He remembered that. Before him, another prophet, Isaiah, he, he got it right. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. And what did the Lord say about what we think? You know these verses very well, but think of it in the context that I've been giving it to you this morning. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will despise the one and hold to the other. Hold to one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what, shall, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Sorry about that. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You see, the problem is we're serving the wrong master. <laughs> Who's your master? Are you your master? Or is the Lord your master? You see, if you're your master, then you've got to take care of everything. You've got to fix every problem. 
You have to come up with a solution to every issue. You've got to convince yourself that you can go on and serve the Lord another day. The problem is you know yourself so well that you know you're lying to yourself. You know, I can't really do this on my own. I'm not good enough to do this. I can't do that. But if the Lord is your master, then you take all that and you give it to him. You say, I can't do it. But I serve you. I'm going to give it to you. If the Lord is your master, it all depends on Him. If the Lord is the master, you come to Him with all your heartache and trauma and all the times you failed before you were saved that you're still carrying with you and all your sin once you've been saved that weighs you down like an anchor. You bring Him all the disappointment with others, with our life, with yourself. You give it all to Him. And He said, come unto me, all you that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You know, if any man carried burdens that weighed him down, Peter certainly did. The Lord calls him out of the boat to walk on the water, and the only other man besides the Lord to ever do that. But when the storm gets high, he takes his eyes off of the Lord and he begins to doubt and he begins to sink and he calls out to the Lord and he, he saves him. But he says, why did you doubt? And then one minute he's ready to die for the Lord and the next minute he's denying the Lord. But you remember on resurrection morning when the women went to the tomb, they found the stone rolled away and Jesus already gone and they met an angel. And the angel said, go and tell the disciples and Peter that you'll find him in Galilee. The Lord wanted Peter to know, I'm not done with you. I know what you've done, but I'm not through with you. And you remember after he was risen and they were on the, on the shore there, they'd been fishing all night and caught nothing. He told them to cast on the other side. Now they couldn't bring it all in. And Peter realized it was the Lord. And he dove in and he swam to shore. And, and the Bible says they're walking together. And the Lord says, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? If you understand the original language it comes from, Peter has to say, Lord, I can't say that I love you like you want me to love you. But I do love you, Lord. But he still said, feed my sheep. Lovest thou me, Lord? I love you not like I, I know I don't love you. He said, feed my sheep. Even after Pentecost, when he had stood and preached and 3,000 were saved, and he, he is serving the Lord all over the place. He's in Antioch one day, and all of a sudden some from Jerusalem come, and, and these Judaizers begin to tell the Gentiles, you've got to follow the law to be a true Christian. And Peter runs and gets over there with them, and Paul says, I had to withstand him to the face. Peter's been up and down. Peter's got baggage. You know, we put Paul on a pedestal, which he himself would never accept. But I think we can all identify with Peter a little more, can't we? I know what it's like. Sunday morning, boy, I'm rip roaring. I love the Lord. Monday morning, I'm flat on my face. Can't believe I did that. Up and down. Well, what had Peter learned after all of that? Late in his life, he wrote, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Peter had learned the secret, carrying all those heavy loads, cast them on him. So how do we win the battle for our mind? How do we defeat the enemy trying to drag us down to the pit of despair? Paul had found it. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, For we would not have you be ignorant, brethren, not have you, brethren, we would not, brethren, have you be ignorant, I'm going to get it right, of our trouble which came to us in Asia. He said, we want you to know about what we've gone through. And we've been preaching through the Pauline epistles on Wednesday night, and we've talked about all the troubles and trials he's gone through. He's writing to the church at Corinth, said, we don't want you to be ignorant about what we've gone through. That we were pressed out of measure. Ever felt like that? We call it stress today. He says, we were pressed out of measure, above strength. It was, it was beyond us to handle, insomuch that we despaired even of life. We didn't know if we would live through this. 
But we have the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. Sometimes I think we miss that, what the, he's saying there. He's saying, when we realize that these struggles and trials were so hard that we didn't know if we could handle them and it might actually kill us, we finally said, okay, fine, we're dead then. We're going to quit trying on our own. Paul said, I die daily. He said, we got it. We said, okay, you know what? It's not me anymore. He said, but we have the sentence of death in ourselves that, here's why we did that, we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. We're going to quit trying on our own. We're going to trust in God. Then he said, who delivered, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver and in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. He said, he has delivered us. He is delivering us and he will deliver us. When you're in the midst of those troubles and every, the enemy's coming against you and dragging you down, you can't do anything. And you're looking at yourself and you're looking at all those things. You're saying, I just can't do that. You finally come say, that's right. I can't do this. But God can. He delivered me yesterday. He can deliver me today. He'll deliver me tomorrow. You see, we turn that mind from looking at all those things to looking at Him. Christ brings light. He brought light into the world. He brings light into our lives when we're saved. He brings light when the darkness descends upon us. And listen, Paul was no ivory tower philosopher. He said, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. He said this, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. You see, it is in His death for our sins and His resurrection for our salvation that brings us victory, that banishes the darkness with the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. I know I, I hit this nail over and over again. You have no idea what it meant when you got saved. It was far more than you can understand. Instantly you were changed from an old creature to a new creature. You were saved from the penalty of sin. You're saved from the power of sin. One day you're going to be saved from the presence of sin. You were brought into the family of God. So much happened at that time. But we tend to go beyond, yeah, I know I'm saved, but look, I'm going through all these trials and all this. Wait, 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 come back over here. You're saved? You're in the family of God? He's your father? The promises He's given you in His Word, those are there for you. Hey, go back to the hat. He said, we're always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. We're always remembering what He's done for us. But here's the thing. He said, God has commanded the light to shine out of darkness, and it shined in our hearts. That darkness that comes, we're all familiar with that darkness. When we turn away from the light of the truth of the Word of God, then darkness comes. He said he's commanded the light to shine out of darkness. We find the light in the word of God. Isaiah said the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. This is a prophecy concerning the birth of Christ. But listen to the language. The people that walked in darkness. Have you walked in darkness? Have you gone through life and said, boy, I don't see any light. It's all dark. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. The Lord Jesus Christ. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Yes, that's a prophecy of the birth of Jesus Christ, but if you're a Savior, you're born again, and He's living within you. You have that light. So how do we win the battle of the mind? Here it is. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's what Paul says. Paul says to give God the things that you're worried about, and He will bring you peace. 
but only if you've truly given it to him. Remember the first part of that verse, be careful for nothing. That word careful means worried. You see, the thing is, we often say, Lord, I don't know what, I'm going to give this to you. Lord, I'm giving all this to you. Here you go. Put it back on our shoulder and keep walking on with it. You can give it to him. In other words, we take it, we give it all to him, and we say, that's it. You've got it. Well, that's hard to do. I don't know how to do that. It's like anything else. It takes practice. A little bit at a time. Lord, I don't know how to do that. I'm just going to trust you with this. I'm, Lord, I'm, I don't know. I'm going to, and oh, he was faithful. Lord, I, I'm going to trust you with a little bit more. He was faithful there too. Before long, we begin to learn the secret, not only of giving all to him, but being careful for nothing. Now, that's the first half of it. There's another half. You see, I said the battlefield is in the mind because our mind will focus on something. If we've got it focused on all the problems and all the trials instead of Him, then, then we're never going to get victory. So we turn away from that, but we've got to focus on something else. So Paul continues. This is the same passage, Philippians 4, 6 through 8. He says, uh, Which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Then he says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Stop thinking on those things and start thinking on these things. You see, if we come and we lay it all to Him and then we walk away and we don't fill that void with something else, guess what? It's coming right back. The vacuum will always be filled with something. And I'm not saying we bury our head in the sand and pretend like our problems aren't there. Just the opposite. We get our head out of the sand thinking that we can take care of them and we realize the truth that only He can take care of them. And we give them to Him and then we run to the Word. Because we're, we're looking for things to think about. Things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report and virtue and praise. And by the way, when you find all those things, they make up the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're looking at Him. That's the answer. So does your life before Christ still haunt you? The Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so if He removed your transgressions from us. You believe the Word of God? As long as you're still looking on that, you won't. But you turn away from that and start looking at the Word of God, you'll find truths. Are you weighed down by sin? If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You believe the Bible or not? Do you worry that your soul is secure? These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Are you broken hearted? He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Are you weak and sick in body? He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Are you ready to give up? My flesh and my heart faileth. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Here's the truth. He said, think on things that are true. Here's the truth. God loves you so much, He sent His Son to die on an old rugged cross to pay for your sins. That's an amazing truth. Not only that, He sent His Word to you so that you could know how to be saved. He sent His Holy Spirit to bring conviction and to bring counsel and to bring comfort. He gave you a family to love you and a church family for you to love and serve and to be lifted up and encouraged by. And He told us in John 14, here, here's the ultimate. And I said, yeah, preacher, I, I know. And I've tried all of that, but it just I, I think I, I'm not going to make it through this. I, I think it's going to take my life. I think it's going to, I don't know when all this is going to end. Well, here's the ultimate truth. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. 
In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Don't quit. Stay in the boat. He said, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to every man according as his work shall be. Friend, if you've never repented of your sin and asked God to forgive you through the blood of Christ, you're still on your way to hell. And the only good news I have for you today is that you have one more opportunity to be saved. This may be your last opportunity, but you only need one. The Bible says all of sin and come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The ultimate darkness is what you're living in right now. There is no light. You, th this book is, may as well be written in a foreign language to you except for a few verses. For God so loved the world. Whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord. There's a few verses that the Holy Spirit enlightens you enough to understand and realize, hey, I am a sinner. I do deserve to die and go to hell. But Jesus died on the cross and paid for my sin. And the Bible says that if we'll confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We can be saved today. He'll become your master. You'll be able to serve the only master who can truly take all that away. And child of God, I say with Peter and Paul this morning, and I conclude with this. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And Paul said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And your Lord says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Father, as we think of this passage, we think of Jeremiah there in Jerusalem with a broken heart looking around at his beloved city and seeing the judgment that had fallen. And it seems that he believed that maybe it would never end. But then he remembered that you are faithful. That your mercies are new every morning. And he was strengthened. Lord, I know there are folks in this auditorium this morning that are going through a dark time from the loss of someone, from a failure, from sin, from pain, whatever it is. Lord, so long as they're looking at that, they can't look away and see the truth. But I pray your Holy Spirit would take the Word of God that's been preached and bring it into their hearts and show them that you love them and that you want to take those things and give them peace. Lord, I just pray your Holy Spirit would do his work, and we would respond according to thy will. In Jesus' name. So we stand together.